Welcome back to another episode of The Field, Cultivating Salvation, by our Father Among the Saints, Ignatius Baryanchaninov. In this study, we explore two aspects of life in the Church, known as the cultivation of virtue and the spiritual battle. We hope this offering enables you to live a life of piety and purity. When I have the occasion to speak with groups of Christians, I like to ask them to tell me what the gospel is. Especially as Orthodox Christians, we should be able to articulate the reason for our hope, to define that hope, and to say something about how we can work toward it. When I ask them, though, people tell me details about the gospel. Instead of telling me what it is, they tell me things related to it instead. This reveals that while they believe something about it, they do not know what the good news is or how and why it is good news. The responses can be divided into at least two camps. For this talk, I will call them sentimental and mechanical. The first, the sentimental, reveals a shallow but psychological commitment to the notion that someone is saved, meaning all their sins are forgiven. Assurance of this safety, based on how they misunderstand the gospel, produces happiness and the feeling that nothing could prevent them from gaining heaven when they die. Conversely, these people often believe that when they die, without going through any preliminary stages, such as personal judgment or reintegration with the body, they simply go to heaven, as if nothing contained in the creed has meaning. The problems created by this way of thinking are numerous. The second is the more mechanical view, which does not rest in anything theoretical, but emphasizes personal, moral virtue. To point out a couple of manifestations of this view, I might list taking credit for so-called good deeds, and something I hear enough to raise concern, people telling me that they are good people. I had one young man tell me this recently after having told me about some pretty bad things he had done. Never mind his pathological slavery to destructive patterns of thought and outwardly wicked deeds, he said, Don't get me wrong, Father. I am a good person. A mechanical view of the gospel can allow for deceptions like this. The problem is that both of these views fail to acknowledge the goodness of the gospel. One, by eliminating any personal response to it beyond simply espousing a desire to be saved. The other, by eliminating the need for repentance, not just at the beginning, but at every step of the way. In this episode of The Field by St. Ignatius Bryanchaninov, we will discuss the interconnectedness between faith, which is different from belief, and works, which must be done in the light, if their quality will be known. Chapter 8 of The Field Faith and Works The Apostle Paul, says Vladika Ignati, considered the essence of the preaching of Christ to be the message of repentance and faith. While many today equate belief with faith and contrast faith with works, we will learn why we should not. Repent and believe in the gospel, we are told, by the gospel. He says, What a simple, true, and holy command. We must repent, leave behind our sinful life before we become capable of approaching the gospels. You may have been surprised to hear me distinguish between belief and faith. If so, I hope to make my meaning clearer in time. But the saint says, in order to accept the gospel, we have to believe in it. This means that believing precedes faith, which in a certain sense is the ability to accept the gospel. Moreover, unless someone believes in the gospel, he will never be able to transcend the realm of what is conceivable to fallen human reason. If one is to accept the gospel, he must first believe it. 
But if one is to act in faith, accepting the gospel in a saving way, he must repent, which means to reject one's sinfulness and even himself, as our Lord says. This is the first step toward following Christ, and according to our teacher, only the soul that willfully rejects sin and directs all of its willpower and strength to divine good is capable of faith. Bishop Ignati says, without self-denial, a person is not capable of faith. His fallen reason fights against faith, demanding an answer of God in all his actions and proof of his revealed truths. The fallen heart wants to live the life of the fallen, which faith strives to mortify. Flesh and blood, ignoring the constant presence of death all around it, wants to live its own life, the life of death and sin. You may not have known, but a priest says a special prayer over each of his clerical garments before making the sign of the cross over them, kissing and putting them on. Each day before I put on my pectoral cross, I say the following prayer. Whosoever shall come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Vladika says that living faith, the kind required of all people, but especially those who call themselves Christians, should be understood in the words, For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The prescribed method for losing one's life is found in the cross of Christ. We could expand on a definition of living faith. Living faith is walking into the spiritual world, the world of God. It cannot exist in a person who is nailed to the cross of the world, ruled by the flesh and sin. It is also the door to God. It is the only door. For the sentimental mind, the idea that the door of faith is blown off by simple belief is a deception that keeps many from the sobering truth that this door opens only slowly before the one who purifies himself with constant repentance. It is open widely only before the pure heart. It is shut for the lover of sin. Where does faith come from exactly? People sometimes say that they need more faith or don't have enough of it. The Lord criticized his hearers saying, O ye of little faith. So how should we understand faith and its derivation? We learn from our teacher that faith is a natural quality of the human soul, planted in man at the creation by the merciful God. This natural quality is chosen by God during the course of redemption as the branch through which to graft grace back onto fallen man. So, while it is true that faith comes from God, we know now that he equipped mankind with it in the beginning. It is not something, therefore, alien or foreign to man's nature. In a certain sense, we can understand that belief in the gospel leads to the ability to exercise living faith, which is impossible unless self-denial precedes it. Living faith is the continuous following of Christ, the acquisition of virtue, and purification of the heart. It is only possible to please God with living faith. It is contrasted with dead faith, or confessing Christ merely out of unwilling necessity. This is something that the demons are capable of. Such faith, says Vladika, will only add to a person's greater condemnation at the judgment of Christ. Faith in Christ is not possible without belief in the gospel, and it cannot be demonstrated in any way other than by keeping the commandments. Therefore, 
The Orthodox Christian is not forced to choose between faith and works, but to see that without works, there is no living faith, and it can be said, no belief in the gospel. The brother of our Lord, the Apostle James, addresses the one who boasts of his dead faith with only bare knowledge of the existence of God by taunting, show me your faith without your works. Those who deny this dynamic do so because of unbelief. Faith, said St. Simeon the New Theologian, in the full sense of this word, contains in itself all of the divine commandments of Christ. To confirm a point I developed in previous episodes, we could cite him further. He says that faith is stamped with the assuredness that there is not a single part of the commandments that has no meaning, that all of them, until the very last iota, are the life and a reason for eternal life. Vladika adds, Believe in the dogmas that are declared by the gospel. Learn and confess them exactly as the Orthodox Church does, because it alone has contained the purity and completeness of the gospel's teaching. Believe in the sacraments established by the Church, by the Lord Himself. Believe the holy, life-giving evangelical commandments, whose correct fulfillment is only possible within the true Church. Uh, okay, Father Methodius, did you just add that last part about the true church? Is it really necessary for you to always mention genuine orthodoxy? First, yes, it is always necessary for me to distinguish between truth and error. Second, I didn't add anything. The language I and other genuine orthodox bishops and clergy use is not new, as some would have us believe. St. Ignatius, St. Ignatius uses the language of true orthodoxy. Like him, today's orthodox bishops and clergy must be able to distinguish between truth and error, and they must reject all heresies and errors. Ecumenism is a bringing together of all heresies. Rejection of ecumenism is a dogmatic and prophetic act required today. He says, the dogmas contain theology given by God himself. Therefore, rejecting the dogmas is nothing less than blasphemy, while perverting the dogmas is another form of blasphemy called heresy. Concerning ecumenism, we could say that, by far, the calendar issue attracts the most attention, and people try to poison the well by accusing traditionalists of fixating on what they call tangential issues. They name the calendar as one of these. What difference does it make if we celebrate the service on another date? They mockingly ask as they celebrate saints and martyrs who are glorified through persecutions and acts of brutality, including murder at the hands of godless authorities tipped off by ecumenist clergy. It is one of many issues, but even the calendar issue, thought of by some as a mere inconvenience, is a dogmatic issue, and to speak dismissively or mockingly against it is blasphemy and heresy. I would like to highlight the fact that the sacraments also are dogmatic. It is not only how, by whom, and for whom they are prepared— but the very action of grace they transmit is dogmatic. According to Bishop Ignati, through the sacraments of the Christian church, the faithful are led to union with divinity, which is the essence of salvation, the stamping of faith with the actions of faith, the full reception of what was once only the pledge of eternal good things. Yes, it's true, your experience of communion is regulated dogmatically. It is not up to a priest how he distributes the sacrament. You may remember how many priests squirmed during the COVID frenzy, thinking about how they would need to justify the fears motivating them to adopt innovative practices like cleansing the spoon with alcohol between communicants and other fear-driven concessions. One might ask, which is the more powerful cleansing agent, the sacrificial blood of God 
or alcohol. These things are dogmatic, and the priests who caved into fear taught something to their people they may never recover from. Try telling someone they should have no fear but trust in God after they watched you do that. But the experience itself is dogmatic as well. What do I mean by that? Receiving communion transforms a person. The precious body and blood of Christ deify the faithful. Many people today believe that they must be transformed before they may receive communion. But is this the case? Of course, preliminary preparation is necessary. But consider this prayer the priest says after receiving communion himself. This that hath touched my lips taketh away all mine iniquities and purges me of all my sins. Moreover, by being submerged in the laver of baptism, a person is buried for this life. He comes out of the baptistry already born for the new life, the life in Christ. And through baptism, the Christian is betrothed to Christ. He is clothed in Christ. Through the communion of his holy mysteries, he is united with Christ. Thus, through the sacraments, he becomes holy Christ's. Vladika adds, Through the fulfillment of God's life-giving gospel commandments, a person's union with Christ is maintained. Do you want to know and do the will of God? You have heard it before and will hear it again. The saint says, Both the will and the reason of Christ are expressed in the gospel commandments. You may have attended a baptism or heard a sermon about baptism, where you heard the newly baptized one referred to as a new creature or a new man. You may have met Orthodox Christians who were totally transformed through baptism. They prepared themselves through catechism, fasting, and prayer. They made a lifelong confession of sins and generally invested themselves, or rather, divested themselves of every worldly attachment. When they emerged from the waters of baptism, they were transformed. But you may have met others who did not exhibit these same characteristics. It isn't so simple that we can say converts are the ones who are very different after baptism, but so-called cradle orthodox seem to be less, shall we say, enthusiastic about their faith. We have all met people from both camps who seemed to glow with grace. And sadly, we have met those from both who don't. They still seem to act in a way that corresponds with what we could call the old man. Bishop Ignati says, Thus, the one who is clothed in Christ, the new man, naturally thinks, feels, and acts as Christ thinks, feels, and acts. However, he warned, To be led by thoughts and emotions of the old man even if they are superficially good, are unnatural to the new man. The new man should be led by the Holy Spirit, just as the old man was led by flesh, blood, and the evil spirit. According to our teacher, you will achieve this when you completely align your life with the commandments of the gospel. In cases where the new man has no time to do good deeds, as in the case of certain martyrs who were baptized in their own blood, the orthodox faith in Christ, sealed with the mystery of baptism, is alone sufficient for salvation. For the rest of us, though, the baptized person has no right to act according to the inclination of his heart's feelings, which depend on the influence of the flesh and blood on the heart no matter how much such feelings may seem to be good. He only should accept those good deeds that the Spirit and Word of God inspire him to do, because such deeds belong to the nature renewed by Christ. True faith in Christ is the only way to salvation, but this faith must be living, expressed through the entire being of a person, and, this common activity of deeds and faith accuses other faith that secretly and criminally hides away in the heart of man. 
Returning to the statement I mentioned earlier by a troubled young man who thinks of himself as a good person, the God-awarded teacher comments, Those who give a high value to the so-called good deeds of our fallen nature are blind. These deeds have their value and honor within time and among people, but not before God, before whom they have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. How is it that anyone raised in the church, raised with the prayer book and services of the church, having been sent to confession until they could go on their own schedule, having read the lives of the saints, attended the conferences, and everything else thought of as necessary. How is it, I ask, that this person could think, let alone describe himself as a good person? Blindness. This is a mechanical view of things. Those who rely on the good deeds of our fallen nature have not come to know Christ. They have not understood the mystery of redemption, and they are snared in the traps of their own false reasoning, raising up against their own half-dead and vacillating faith the foolish asking, Is God so unfair that good deeds done by heretics and idolaters will not be crowned by eternal salvation? These so-called judges extend the incorrectness and weakness of their own arguments to the judgments of God. With great boldness, the good bishop continues, If good deeds, according to the feelings of the heart, would give salvation, then the incarnation of Christ would have been a pointless act. If in the past the thought occurred to you that my teachings can be somewhat direct. You may be shocked to hear the way Bishop Ignati, we could call him Ignati the Recluse, wrote. It's true. I've had some people call me out as being too forceful. I've also been accused of such craziness as anti-Semitism. All this because I do not wish to wander away from the teaching of the Holy Fathers. It saddens me that people react negatively, but I don't know what I can do to change without compromising the truth. I guess that people today don't like to deal with reality, and I am not in the business of presenting anything else. We are in trouble. But the solution is right in our hands. The one who believes in Christ holds a drawn sword against the emotions of the heart, and he forces his heart, using the sword of obedience to Christ, to cut off not only obvious sinful inclinations, but even those desires that seem to be good, but, in their essence, contradict the gospel commandments. And this means all actions of man that are inspired by the fallen nature. Vladika teaches us that the Jews were unlawful enemies of faith because they demanded from the faithful only superficial ritual acts of the Old Testament. In the same way, the sons of the God-hating world lawlessly require those who believe in Christ to fulfill good deeds according to the reasoning and feelings of our nature because they do not know Christ in a mystical yet essential way. What are these worldly deeds expected of us by the God-hating world? I often point to the lifestyles of those who are nominally attached to the church, but who cannot find time to live a church-centered life. It is common for people to use careers, education, travel, sports, social groups, and other interests as excuses to justify their laissez-faire relationship to a local parish. Am I simply being truculent by harping on these tendencies? I don't think so. I could be wrong, but I don't. Father Methodius, we think all the things you said are important and should be pursued as expressions of Christian piety, so why don't you just get off our back? We come to church on Sunday almost every week. Isn't that the minimum requirement? First, the minimum requirement is that all your time, attention, energy, strength, and love be allocated to God by the purification of your heart. Second, the saint says, 
These apparently good deeds, inspired by fallen nature, grow the person's ego, destroy faith in Christ, and are antagonistic to God. I don't ever have these kinds of conversations with the people who live church-centered lives and who might occasionally miss one or another service. But I do have them with people who don't. Why is this? And what is the difference between these two types? Vladika says, The works of true faith destroy a person's selfishness, uniting him to Christ, and increasing faith yet more. Well, Father Methodius, we think you are being selfish by telling us that we should come to church more. Not selfish, my friend zealous for your salvation. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God, as the scripture says. Earlier, I mentioned how martyrs baptized in their own blood were saved before other works could be offered. And there is another way to be saved without additional works. It is through confession. True living faith even if a person only confesses it with his lips, brings him salvation, the saint says. What kinds of examples does our Father among the saints give, and what are the conditions for this saving declaration? He mentions the thief on the cross and many sinners who received salvation in the last minutes of their life. It is so important, so necessary to confess the heart and soul's beliefs with the mouth of faith, that the holy martyrs of all ages of Christianity, starting with the apostles of Christ, considered it better to suffer terrible and prolonged suffering, to pour out their blood like water, rather than utter a rejection of Christ, even if only with the lips, without the agreement of the heart. As I explained earlier, martyrdom is a deed of faith. And for those tempted to peer behind the curtain and to pose hypothetical questions about heretics and sectarians who suffered ostensibly for Christ's sake, we should consider the following. Every thought of the God-given dogmas is so important that the holy confessors, like the martyrs, witnessed the orthodox confession of the dogmas by long suffering and streams of their own blood. We do not judge another man's servant, but we do know that many people who call themselves Christians and who suffer great atrocities suffer as heretics and schismatics, not as martyrs. Martyrdom is a dogmatic experience. A Christian confessor or martyr must be orthodox in his beliefs. As important as faith is to the work of salvation, so correspondingly heavy are the sins against faith. Every one of these is a mortal sin. That is, they result in the death of the soul. And after them comes eternal perdition, eternal suffering in the pits of hell. I don't like this any more than any other person who is not a psychopath. But like it or not, this is what the Holy Father taught. And my duty is to transmit it while petitioning Christ God to grant me a heart to believe. Today, people call traditionalist priests schismatics, which, according to the fathers, is worse than a heretic. These same people, out of the other side of their mouths, say that judging is always a sin. Which is it, though? Is it always wrong to judge? If so, then it is most certainly wrong to condemn someone for a sin worse than heresy. Heresy, says our teacher, is a mortal sin. It contains blasphemy in itself and infects the one who is far from true faith in Christ with blasphemy. I think the contemporary ecumenist needs to revisit the gospel commandments to see if he has misappropriated his energy by condemning that which God has approved through miracles, glorifications, and fidelity to the truth in confession and martyrdom. My prayer for certain representatives of the fight from within camp 
is that they will come to their senses. Some of them constantly share teachings from genuine orthodoxy while rejecting the church that preserves those teachings. They take some kind of refuge from the notion that they can subscribe to the teachings of traditionalism while belonging to the groups opposed by those very teachings. They are self-important and as such are self-styled confessors in error. Grant, O Lord, that no one is led astray by what is called orthodox wisdom, but is more of a psyop, mixing truth with error. Church history tells us that in the first centuries of Christianity, during the times of persecutions, some pagans uttered the confession of Christ flippantly with the desire to mock Christians. When they were suddenly overwhelmed by the grace of God, they immediately turned from hardened pagans to zealous Christians and ended up sealing that confession, which was first uttered as a blasphemy with their own blood. As he concludes this chapter, St. Ignati offers a very helpful projection to help us understand how war against the flesh is waged. Having previously described the patriarchs of old, he offers a description of how monks subject themselves to exposure and self-renunciation. Combining faith with works, as anyone who wishes to be delivered from passions must do, he says, they entered the fray against sin. They cast it out of their actions, their thoughts, their emotions, and the Holy Spirit descended onto their pure souls, filling them with grace-filled gifts. The lifestyle adopted by those who wish to be saved, and thus to move through this progression from actions to feelings, is one of deeds of faith. Do they suffer in this life? Absolutely. And this scares many away from doing more than superficially accepting orthodoxy, which we now understand as an expression of dead faith. They limp along, coming to church occasionally, but without really knowing why or why they should bother. But in those who have attained Christian perfection, strengthened faith with the help of the Holy Spirit looks very clearly at the promises of God as if seeing and feeling eternal good things already in this life. And those who have been enriched with living faith in Christ change with respect to the visible world and the earthly life. They fly through all sorrows and difficult circumstances as if they had wings. They do not feel pain and disease. They consider God to be the only doer in the universe and they have made him their own through living faith in him. Faith comes by hearing. Our teacher says, listen to the gospels that speak to you and the holy fathers who explain the gospels. Listen to them attentively, and little by little, living faith will settle within you, which will require you to fulfill the gospel commandments. For this fulfillment, you will be rewarded with the hope of inevitable salvation. Faith will make you a follower of Christ on earth and his co-inheritor in heaven. Amen. Please join me next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Field. Please consider supporting this traditional Orthodox ministry. We rely upon your prayers, charity, and magnanimity. Like, share, subscribe, visit, send prayer requests, and consider how you can support our missionary outreach. Find me at YouTube and on Instagram at Art of Prayer Workshop. Check out and follow our parish on Facebook. Send financial support using PayPal to fellowheirs at hotmail.com.